schedule. I might be in Borneo that day. <laughs> so we're glad that he's not here, uh, that he's not there, because we can have him here with us today. Um, I will also mention that he has a book that came out last year called, uh, I have it somewhere, Bottled and Sold, the story behind our obsession with bottled water. Highly recommended. Uh, and so without further ado, Peter Gleick. Well, good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you for coming out on a Sunday morning. Uh, it's early for me, too, but that was a, a wonderful introductory talk. Um, we're going to move from reality TV to perhaps a little bit of reality science. Um, there is mud wrestling in climate science, I have to say, although, although so far there hasn't been any coconut oil um, or eating of insects or that kind of thing, but, but maybe, that, maybe that's coming. Um, to some degree, uh, climate science is today a contact sport. I would perhaps be the older geek, um, but this is a field filled with older geeks, so it maybe wouldn't be that, that unique. But I would also be the one boiling the water, because I know what's in that water, and, and I don't care how desperate you are. I know what parasites are like in the water around the world. Um, my field of training is actually climate science. I'm a climatologist by training and a hydrologist. Uh, I direct the Pacific Institute, which is in Oakland. I live in Berkeley, so it wasn't that far for me to come. Uh, the Institute's an independent nonprofit research institute. We work on global water issues. We do a lot of work and have for, for a couple of decades uh, worked on the implications of climate change for water resources. Um, and so uh, this is a, a subject near and dear to my heart. Um, what I would like to do is talk about, uh, the, the title in your program is Climate Change Misperception. What I'm really going to talk about is uh, not so much the science of climate change. I, I'm not going to tell you why climate change is happening, why it's because of human activity. I'm not going to too much get into the debate about climate science, but I'm going to talk more broadly about logical fallacies, about the nature of the debate about climate. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about how we argue about science in general uh, with specific reference to climate change. So I'm also going to talk a little bit about the role of science and policy because in my opinion, the debate about climate is not really a science debate. It's a science debate that's, it's a policy debate that's masquerading as a science debate. <clears throat> I do believe that good policy without good science uh, and without good analysis is, at best, unlikely uh, that we're not going to get good policy unless there is good science behind it. I think more strongly that we're certainly not going to get good policy with bad science. Uh, and we're seeing some of that happening now as well. Uh, there is also, as, as all of you in this room know better than perhaps most audiences I talk to, a long history of abuse and misuse of science in the policy arena. But, as I said, I do believe that the argument about climate change is really a policy debate hiding behind a scientific debate. Um, the really interesting and difficult questions about climate change are not science questions, but there, there are plenty of difficult, unresolved science questions in the climate area. But the really difficult issues, I think, are policy questions. If the science of climate change is real, if humans are changing the climate, what we do about that is a difficult, difficult policy question. But I think that's the debate that we ought to be having, rather than the debate that most of us hear. So I'm going to talk a little bit about logical fallacies. I'm going to talk a little bit about abuse of the scientific process. I'm going to talk about uncertainty and skepticism and public policy. I would argue, as most of you would probably argue, that scientists are, are by nature, or ought to be by nature, skeptics. That's the nature of science. It doesn't always work out that way. So let me start with some background on logical fallacies, which again, many of you are familiar with. Logical fallacies, very simply, are patterns of reasoning that are always, or at least often, wrong due to a flaw in the structure of the argument that re renders the argument invalid. That's the classical definition of a logical fallacy. There are many, many different kinds of logical fallacies. I'm going to talk about a subset of them um, 
uh, in particular in the context of climate change or some other scientific debates. And in particular, I'm going to talk about some of these. I'm going to talk about arguments from ignorance, arguments from error, arguments from misinterpretation, arguments from ideology, which are very common, that could be from personal belief or personal incredulity, I, something I just, I just can't believe that this could be true, uh, whether or not independent of what the science might say, arguments from tradition, um, arguments from consensus, which is a very important one, and I'll talk about that, uh, arguments from appeal to authority, and I'll touch on most of these. So arguments from ignorance. Um, many of you may have seen this. This is a, a classic Dilbert cartoon, and for those of you who may be able to not read it, Dilbert is out on his first date. Dilbert went out on a lot of first dates. Uh, and the woman he's with says, I collect crystals. And Dilbert's thinking to himself, uh-oh. Uh, I don't know of any scientific evidence that they can heal. And Dilbert says, phew. And then she says, but it's my point of view that they do. And Dilbert, instead of thinking to himself, says, when did ignorance become a point of view? <laughs> and you can tell from the look on her face this is going to be another one of Dilbert's first dates that, that doesn't turn into a second date. So this is an argument from ignorance. Lack of evidence, lack of information, either unwillingness to look at evidence and look for science, or inability to do so, but a strong opinion. It's my point of view that they do. That's an argument from ignorance. You get arguments from error, just making a mistake. And this is an old 1956 New Yorker magazine cartoon. And again, for those of you who can't read it in the back, it's a bunch of, in 1956, bearded male scientists <laughs> sitting around and they're staring at a blackboard with incredibly complicated stuff all over it. And one of them is saying to the other, say, I think I see where we went off. Isn't 8 times 7 56? <laughs> so scientists make mistakes. That's the nature of science. We make mistakes. And frankly, when we make mistakes, there's another scientist more than happy to point out our mistakes. That's the scientific process. Scientists make their reputation in part by pointing out mistakes that another scientist makes. But arguments from error are made. And that's a logical fallacy. Arguments from ideology. And again, the cartoon is a guy's looking through a microscope in a research lab, and he's saying, darn, you're right. They've all been contaminated by politics. <laughs> Arguments from ideology are very common. Uh, they're often rooted in religion. Sometimes they're rooted in, uh, rooted in politics. Uh, Galileo versus the church, that was an argument from ideology, or in this case, against ideology. Modern literalists, creationists, intelligent design, Lysenkoism, which set back Soviet biological sciences for decades, was an argument from ideology. Uh, and ideology doesn't make good science. Arguments from consensus. Uh, this is an important one uh, because it cuts both ways. An argument from consensus is the argument that something's right just because a large group believes it's right. Galileo was arguing against the consensus of the time, which was an ideological consensus. But everyone believed that the Earth was the center of the universe. Not everyone, but that was the common consensus of the time. And the argument that he was wrong simply because everybody else believed this other thing was an argument from consensus. Now, in the climate area, is climate change a very serious problem because the vast majority of climate scientists believe it is? That would be an argument from consensus. I believe that climate change is a big problem because all of my colleagues believe it is, or most of them do. No, that's backwards. In fact, the argument about climate change is not an argument from consensus. Climate change is a serious problem because the evidence has convinced the vast majority of scientists who work in this field that it's a problem. And it could still be wrong. The consensus is not what gives power to the conclusion. The science gives, leads to the consensus. So sometimes in the climate debate, 
We, the, there's a group of, a small group of people who still don't believe that climate change is a real problem or caused by humans. And they say, look, it's just because all of you guys believe it is, that's an argument from consensus. And I don't think that is. I think that's backwards. I think the consensus is the result of the science. And of course, there's a consensus about gravity. And there's a consensus about the fact that my cell phone will work when I turn it on. Uh, that's not an argument from consensus. And so the opposite of that is the argument against consensus. How do you argue against a consensus? And of course, the classic uh, enunciation of this is Carl Sagan, who said, extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence. When there is a scientific consensus, arguing against it requires that you have good evidence. You have good scientific evidence, observational, theoretical uh, modeling that that is a requirement, and that's a requirement in science. And of course, Carl Sagan wasn't the first to say this. Laplace said, the weight of evidence for an extraordinary claim must be proportioned to its strangeness. When you have a strange claim arguing against consensus, you had better have weighted evidence. And he perhaps wasn't the first either. David Hume said, a wise man therefore proportions his belief to the evidence. So that's the other side of the argument for consensus or by consensus. Now, in that sense, you can't read this <laughs> intentionally. This is, a, as Jeannie would say, a terrible PowerPoint slide. <laughs> I show it because of the headline. The headline is, every scientific body of international standing accepts the findings of human-induced effects of climate. That climate is changing and that humans are largely responsible for the changes. And this is the American Chemical Society, the American Physical Society, the American Association for the Advancement of Science, the all of the geophysical, si uh, chemical, um, uh, geological, physical, meteorological, national academies of science of every country of the world all have put out statements so in support of the consensus that humans are changing the climate. And you can look all of them up, they're all online. But that's the nature of the, the consensus around the science of climate change. And I would repeat, we could all be wrong. I, that's, the, that's science. We could be wrong. And some scientist or some group of scientists that is able to marshal the evidence, observational, theoretical, modeling evidence that all comes up with a better explanation for what we see, for what we understand about physics and atmospheric dynamics, is going to be a very famous person. But we haven't found them yet. Another one, appeal to authority not competent to address the issue. <laughs> Can we appeal this to the Supreme Court, says George Bush. And this is actually, uh, was during the George Bush administration when the National Academy of Sciences came out with another one of their many repeated reports talking about the human effects of climate. Um, and of course, this was after he had just appealed to the, there had been this appeal to the Supreme Court about the 2000 election, which you may remember. Yeah, yeah. So, you want to appeal to authorities, but authorities that are competent to rule on the nature of the debate. That's an important part of avoiding a logical fallacy. So, there are lots of other logical fallacies, but there are also other categories of abuse of science. There is appeal to emotion. There are personal and ad hominem attacks. That's a very common one. And I'll come to some of those. Straw man arguments. Let's make sure we understand what we're really arguing. Misuse of facts or selective use of facts, and I'll come back to some examples of that. Misuse of uncertainty, and I'll come back to that as well. Inappropriate generalizations, falsification of evidence, suppression of evidence, and every now and then in the scientific world, papers are retracted because some scientist falsified evidence, and it, doesn't, it just doesn't take long for them to get found out. I don't understand what the motivation for this is, except desperation. Because scientists have to reproduce other people's evidence. And if you can't reproduce it, then you're in trouble. Manipulation of the scientific process, bullying of scientists. There are lots of ways that the scientific process can be abused. And whenever you're faced with a debate about science, you have to think to yourself, OK, is this an ad hominem attack? Is this an appeal to emotion? Is this an appeal to one of these logical fallacies when you evaluate what you're really being faced with? <laughs>
So let me talk about a couple of these. Ad hominem attacks uh, or appeals to emotion. Con uh, global warming is, quote, unproven at best and liberal claptrap at worst. Congressman Dana Rohrbacher, a particularly egregious anti-climate congressman from California. Um, liberal claptrap. Okay, it's an attempt to define climate as a left-right Democratic Republican, liberal, conservative issue, when the science isn't, or certainly shouldn't be. The policy debates may be, but let's separate those. Global warming is the greatest hoax ever perpetrated on the American people. Senator James Inhofe, another uh, very vociferous anti-climate person in the Senate. Um, Al Gore can't be trusted on climate change because he lives an energy-intensive lifestyle. Al Gore's been a real target. I'm glad I'm not Al Gore for a lot of reasons. Um, but he may live an energy intensive lifestyle. In fact, he does live an energy intensive lifestyle. But that's completely independent of what, whether or not what he says about the climate is right or wrong. That's an ad hominem attack, not an attack on the science. He may be hypocritical because of that, but that also is independent of the science. That's ad hominem. Scientists have ideologies, they are politicized, says Peggy Noonan in an op-ed in the Wall Street Journal. Um, an attempt to discredit scientists. Scientists do have ideologies, we have opinions. We ought to be allowed to have opinions, but we ought to make sure that our policy opinions are separate from our science opinions and that when we express an opinion, a personal opinion, it's different from when we express our science. And that's important. <coughs> Suppression of information, selective choice of data, cherry picking. I'm going to spend a little more time with this because there's some really interesting examples. Uh, and if you understand them, it helps us think about arguments for or against any particular kind of science. So um, I was given an email. Uh, about a week or two ago from someone who has come to Skeptical in the past uh, about why they weren't coming this year. And they weren't coming this year because I was on the agenda. Um, and they were, it was a long email, there was some ad hominem stuff there, which I won't go into. Uh, but when you come right down to it, there was a little bit of a core of science in this email. And um, this person said, I'm so disappointed to see my local skeptical organization committing to the global warming issue prematurely. An objective review of the actual scientific data makes clear that CAGW, catastrophic anthropogenic global warming proponents, have not made their case that CO2 has caused a meaningful portion of the mild warming seen 1900 and 1998, but since stopped as CO2 continues to grow. There's a lot there. I've highlighted a couple of words. First of all, inviting me doesn't commit anyone to anything. You guys have your own opinions. I, I don't even know if the organizations that, that set this up have an opinion about climate change. My opinion doesn't reflect on them. So I appreciate the invitation. I was honored by the invitation. I've been a long time I was an early subscriber to Skeptical Inquirer, but, but my opinions don't commit you guys to anything. On the global warming issue prematurely. It's been 30 years. <laughs> so it's not premature, in my opinion, but be that as it may. Uh, I highlighted CAGW because it's actually sort of important. CAGW stands for Catastrophic anthropogenic global warming. Um, okay, so I, I don't know if it's going to be catastrophic. That, that's sort of an ad hominem label. It, it's labeling. Uh, I am an anthropogenic global warming proponent. Not that I'm in favor of <laughs> anthropogenic global warming, but I believe the science that suggests that happening. The catastrophic thing is a, sort of a straw man argument. Uh, uh, so we'll leave that where it is. But then there's some science points here that are important to think about. Haven't made their case that CO2 has caused a meaningful portion of the mild warming seen from 1900 to 1998 that's since stopped. Okay, so I don't know this person. There is a huge spectrum 
of debate about global warming from the deniers who simply say cl climate change isn't happening at all. Yes, it's happening, but humans aren't responsible because it's natural. Yes, it's happening and humans are responsible maybe for a tiny portion of it. Well, you know, there's a big spectrum here. This person is not saying there's no global warming. There has been mild warming since 1900. He's saying, yes, there's been some warming, but it's mild. Uh, CO2 hasn't caused a meaningful portion of it. He's not saying CO2 is not responsible. He's saying CO2 is not responsible for much of it. He's saying a couple of specific things. Global warming has stopped since 1998. It warmed to 98, but it has since stopped, but CO2 has continued to grow. So there are actually some things we could dig into here as skeptics. We could say, okay, let's look at the science of this. And so I'm going to look at some of the science of these things. In particular, two questions, and I'm really going to look at one of them in detail. The first, CO2 is not responsible for a meaningful portion of the warming, or the warming is natural. And two, warming stopped in 1998. Now, there's some numbers here. 18, 1, 29, 59. You don't know what those are, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to remind you of a joke that most of you have heard. A, a guy walks into a bar. <laughs> okay, you've all heard it. <laughs> a, a guy walks into a bar, and there are a bunch of old guys sitting in the corner. And they're sitting around drinking, and they're not talking much. And every now and then, one of them says, 26. And they all laugh. And then there's silence for a few more minutes. And then another one says, 59. And they all laugh. And, and he, so he goes up to them and says, what, what's going on here? And he says, well, we've all been sitting in this bar for years. We all know each other. We all know our jokes. So a few years ago, we just numbered them. <laughs> and now, instead of telling the joke, we just go, 26. And everybody knows what joke it is. And, and we laugh. So, so that's the numbering story. Now, the, the joke continues. The, guy sits around, the new guy sits around, and he goes, 37, and nobody laughs. And he says, well, what was the problem? Isn't 37 a joke? And he says, yes, but you told it badly. <laughs> OK, but, but that's not relevant. But you might want to tell that joke to your friends. <laughs> the debate about climate change has been going on for so long, and the arguments against climate change have been repeated so many times, they've been given numbers. There is a website called skeptical science dot skeptical climate? Skeptical, I think it's actually skeptical science. Skeptical science dot org. It's a wonderful resource for those of you interested in the debate about climate where every one of the arguments against climate change has been laid out the response with scientific evidence and links to the science and peer-reviewed papers is, is attached. There's a basic argument. There's a sophisticated argument. It's a really great resource. And they've all been given numbers. So CO2 is not responsible for a meaningful portion of warming, or the warming is mostly natural or entirely natural. That's number one, and number 18, and number 29, and 50, anyway. And there are 163 of these, or 167 of these now. Warming has stopped in 98. That's number nine. Literally, warming stopped in 1998. That's number nine. And, and 23, and not, so if you're interested, you can follow those up. The only thing I'm going to say about number one is that if there's any piece of the science we understand, it's the behavior of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere and the way they work radiatively. It, I'm not going to go into it in any more deal except, uh, detail except to say that if we didn't understand this, heat-seeking missiles wouldn't work. <laughs> We understand thermodynamics of the atmosphere and the radiative properties of these gases. It's, it's beautiful, and the science is clear.